Shoyang. Shoyang. Siyang. Shoyang. Oh my gosh. My Mandarin has gotten so much worse. I blame it on Vietnam because the Vietnamese language, it's similar, but not really. Oh, it's messing me up. Anyways, welcome to ACE. I'm your host, Darren. And on this show, we explore the self-employed creative life and how to do your best work. We also want to showcase different types of wisdom that can help you as you build your ideal life and your ideal career. Ancient wisdom, body wisdom, all types of wisdom that don't get enough airtime. And this week's guest, oh man, she was so much fun to talk to. Uh, Her name is Mimi Kwadimer. She's an internationally renowned yoga practitioner. She is also the author of two books, including Shil Yang. (laughs) Oh man, I'm getting so nervous just saying it. But this term means self-cultivation, a cultivation of the heart and a nurturing of the heart. What does this mean? And how can we apply this wonderful philosophy to our lives and our work? This is what I talked to Mimi about, and she just has such a nuanced language to discuss self-cultivation and all the philosophical and spiritual and physical practices that are encompassed by this term. So I really hope this conversation gives you some different lenses to see the world, perhaps a different mindset to approach a problem or a frustration or a criticism. And yeah, I I look forward to your thoughts and I will definitely come back to this conversation often to take notes. Remember, we do have a website, upstartist.tv slash ace. In fact, in this conversation, Mimi and I discuss how different times of day correspond to different elements, such as earth, fire, water, wood, metal, and different parts of the body as viewed by traditional Chinese medicine. So you can find those very interesting and useful diagrams in the show notes to this episode at upstartist.tv slash ace. I look forward to meeting you over there and having a conversation with you. So let's get to the episode. Here we go. My next guest is an internationally recognized teacher of yoga and qigong. She has practiced and taught for over 20 years in China, the UK, Europe, and the United States. She founded Beijing's first yoga studio. She has amazingly helpful qigong videos on her YouTube page. So if you're itching to get started, I highly recommend uh, you go there. She's also written two books, including Su Yang, which we will be discussing today. And I have to say that I really admire her for her fusion of both the physical and philosophical in patterning her own philosophy. And and I'm really interested to learn more about how she's done that and how she's arrived to her personal philosophy. So Mimi Kwadimer, welcome to ACE. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Mimi, I know you've done so much in your career. You're not just a yoga teacher. I'd like to start with a quote from the introduction of Xiu Yang that really grabbed me right away. This is what you wrote. You said, at the beginning, I assumed, like many people do, that to heal myself meant fixing myself and embarking on a path of self-improvement. And what I've learned over time is that rather than seeing yourself as somehow damaged or flawed, you can remember that beneath the crusty layers of tension, tiredness, or anxiety is an already intact sense of self that is whole and complete. And to me, you know, this really set the stage for the the book. And I'm just curious, you know, how did you arrive at that understanding or or how did you make that part of your, you know, personal philosophy? I think it was a journey of my own health, uh, and I was not a very healthy kid. I was actually very troubled by lung problems. I had asthma. I had a lot of digestive dis- disorders. Uh, I was born with jaundice. I had pneumonia when I was four. I, I really didn't feel like I was actually equipped with a very healthy state of um, 
of, of living for much of my, my young, sort of uh, young, younger days. But what I recognized was that through some of the practices I started uh, and the sense of coming back to myself, there was a part of myself that was not sort of flawed and diseased. And it was, I think it, it was a process of recognizing as well that everything around me, everything in the natural world, I am also part of that. And there's, there's no separation. We are nature and we're nature manifest in human form. And uh, there's a, many kind of angles that I think I could approach that, that answer to uh, your question from. But I think it's, um, you know, it's a sense that I think so many people feel like, and I felt like I had to embark on these different strategies to find my health, whereas actually the health is already there. And there's a lot of different philosophies that underpin this. I think the beginnings of that was through the yogic idea that there is this sense of self that is whole and complete and that that, that sense of self is eternal. And this is a, a philosophical kind of viewpoint that I started off with believing and, and, and exploring and experimenting and, and through kind of my body getting a sense for that, not in a verbal way or in a, in a, in a way that I feel like, felt like I could articulate in, in words. Um, but through a, a felt sense. And later I, I discovered the practices of Qigong, Chinese medicine, the five element theory, five phases, and then Buddhist ideas that were very similar to many of the Taoist ideas from Qigong. What I recognize is that there isn't something necessarily fixed, but there is something that is always there and and fluid. And that part of myself is is always okay that's adaptable and changeable and responsive to what is all around me. And what is around me is also within me. And what is within me is everything around me. So, yeah. And it's a very, uh, it's a very kind of rebellious way of looking at the self. <laughs> I think you might sound good. Like we're part of nature and nature is part of us. Uh, but actually it's, it's rebellious because if you've grown up like I have, and maybe you have in, in the West, that we've inherited this viewpoint of nature as something that's separate from us, that the sort of pre-modern thinkers, Rousseau, Machiavelli, Descartes, uh, they all basically put us on this path of thinking that nature is something that we master and conquer and control, and that we're more like machines than we are living organisms. And so I say it's rebellious because it's going against that conventional way of thinking that we've inherited for the last few hundred years uh, and, and turning that around and actually looking at ourselves as uh, not the masters of nature, but part of nature, which is an originally Asian, Taoist, Chinese, Confucian thinking. And how much of that discovery for you was through your physical practices of, of yoga and qigong versus reading about philosophy and you know recent western philosophy and ancient chinese philosophy or a ancient eastern philosophy and teaching so many of your students and you know helping them on their journeys you know i think that's the heart of many questions is what is embodied and what is uh, cerebral, right? What is what is a mental process and what is a, a quote physical process? But for me, they're 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 not so distinctive. Although I appreciate sort of you know study and learning, and I love sort of this geeky academic side of things. It stimulates me in a certain way. But what I found is that through the reading, like there's an embodied sense of that, and that there's not a separation of that. The information informs my body, but my body is also informing the way in which I'm absorbing the information that I'm reading. And they're, they're not, uh, you know, through the physical practices, I, I can explore and sense and get into more of a, a, a direct experience of some of the things I've read and heard described. And I can't say whether those two are, uh, which is feeding off of which, but I, I do get the sense that there, there isn't such a separation for me. And then when I teach it, it it's almost as though it's coming it, for me, I, I always tell this to my students, it has to come from a felt experience, it has to come from a direct sort of sense of what you believe is authentic and sincere in your own experience before you share it out with anyone else. 
So I might read about something, but I take everything with a grain of salt. And I, I also believe that um, what the Buddha said, he says, you know, don't take my word for this. Go and see for yourself. That's the most important thing is you can have as much theory as you want, but to to only live in your head and not absorb it and feel it through the, the sense, you know, interoceptive aspect of experience, um, we're missing out on a huge gift and resource and richness. That's why I think your book to me was so much fun to read, but it, it's it's also challenging, right? Because it's not just like an idea about Su Yang. It's it's a being of Su Yang and that requires practice. That requires and you have all these exercises in your book which are fantastic, but maybe we can get to, you know, as a starting place, the definition of Su Yang for our audience. Can you just explain what it means and, and where you derive that and why that's kind of the center of your mandala, mandala? I don't know how to say that word, yeah. mandala? <laughs> mandala. Mandala. Yeah. And it, <laughs> Xiu, Xiuyang is how you pronounce Xiu, it. Xiuyang, in, thank you. Xiuyang in Chinese and Mandarin. Xiuyang is short for Xiu Xin Yang Xin in Mandarin. That means to cultivate and nurture your heart. And there's derivatives of this. There's also Xiu Xin Yang Shen, which is cultivate your heart and nurture your body. And Yang Shen is actually a really popular term that uh, I think there's a book out there as well now called uh, Yang Shen. But Xiu Yang to me was used to describe the um, cultivation practices that sages and emperors and uh, spiritual seekers from ancient China embraced. And it was more than just the physical body. You know, it wasn't just nurturing the body. It was nurturing and refining the, the aspect of self that is multidimensional. And uh, Xiaoyang, so it means nurture, so, you know, cultivate and nurture your heart, but it also implies that uh, we are like a seed that can grow. You know, given the right conditions, you put a seed in soil, and with sunlight, fertilizer, enough rain, and some wind to strengthen the stalks, uh, you'll you'll get a tree. You'll get a, a healthy, living plant. Uh, and nourishment is what we as human beings also need for not only our survival, but sort of a, a way to express ourselves in uh, a more full way, in a capacity that's creative and enlivening and uh, awake. Um, so, for me, I think it's you know the cultivation of self involves uh, our bodies but also our hearts and our minds and also our relationships in the world. And, you know, in ancient China, xiu yang, someone was often described as, ah, you know, this person really has a lot of xiu yang. Describe someone who's like very out upstanding and ethical and kind of virtuous and, uh, and, and well, well raised, you know, good, good parenting and good influences and, and all that. Um, that person would have a lot of xiuyang. Um, but xiuyang is also the process that this person would use to achieve xiuyang, especially the virtuous aspect, I mean, of you know, how we are in relationship with others, uh, how we are in the world is really important. Um, so in the book, I, I looked at kind of creating this orientation for people through the mandala, which shows ourself as the center of everything and the everything is also ourself but this aspect of self relates to you know the body the mind the heart and uh the world carl jung for example used a lot of mandalas in his his psychotherapy work to help one look past the, the egoic state and into more of a, a transpersonal state like a, a connected oneness um, that we are part of everything and everything is part of ourselves. And we, we sometimes feel separated from everything that's around us. But with the mandala, to, to really see ourselves as part of these different sectors and segments that intersect and um, have kind of a, an effect on us. Yeah, there, there's some recurring themes, you know, throughout the book, some recurring metaphors. 
And I'd like to bring three of them up and ask you about them. So one of them, just to to add on to what you're saying, is this idea of unity, that nothing is separate, right? That we are at the center of our worlds, but we're also part of the world, as you said. And this quote really moved me. You said that knowing that nothing is separate, and you brought up like the yin and yang symbol, and you're talking about how it lets you recognize that our experience is not fragmented or divided, but a dance of opposites. Some days you will be in the sun, and other days in the shade. This does not change the totality of your being. So when we accept this approach to experience, we can begin to let go of hoping for pleasure or struggling against pain. And that really grabbed me because, again, going back to the first quote, I think so many times when we think of taking care of ourselves, we look at ourselves as broken or like we're trying to stamp out some sort of sin. And it's like, no, I don't want that part of me. That part of me sucks, right? But but this idea that nothing is separate and that you, you mentioned, you know, staying open to the whole landscape of, of yourself and the world in that sense. Yeah, could you just talk a little bit more about that, about unity? Hmm. If you look at Eastern framework, Western framework, let's just sort of look using that simple dichotomy. Yeah, yeah. Considering opposition within the yin yang symbol and darkness and light or shadow and sun, opposition doesn't necessarily mean conflict or I should say polarity doesn't mean opposition or conflict necessarily. They're not opposed to each other. In fact, it they're they're one becomes the other. There's a being and becoming. And in in the West, this model is very difficult for people because we often look at and idealize this movement from darkness to light of good over evil, of getting rid of the bad in favor of the good. And it's a very linear model. Mm. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Chinese model of yin and yang and its polarity, and you might call it opposition, but it's not conflict, right? It's almost an absurd idea to think that it's just like um, positive and negative currents and electricity. If you took away the negative current, it would collapse the the system. Right? If you if you took away one, the other wouldn't exist. And and so we're not looking at kind of overcoming one in favor of the other because if you did that, it, it just would render the whole the wholeness obsolete. And good is only good because something else is not as good. Bad is only bad because something else is better. (laughs) Which is a hard concept for a lot of people to work with. But if we actually look at that concept and embody it and feel it, then if we get sick, for example, and we're, we're, we're upset that we're sick. Right now it's, you know, very much on everyone's mind, this coronavirus, right? But if if we're thinking that as like pushing that away, not wanting that to happen, not wanting it close to us and not identifying with it, whatever we try to push away usually pushes back at us even harder. And similar with like, you know, anything that we look at in society, we don't like this, we disagree with that. And, and then that creates a separation and it creates this tension. Whereas if we just said that that's, that's one way of looking at it, or this is one manifestation of what's happening in my experience, then it almost diffuses its potency over us. Right? We don't see it as uh, something that we're trying to overcome, but rather we're embracing it, acknowledging it, saying it's there, and then working with it and recognizing that it is on a continuum. And if we allow it to move through its course, then the opposite will come back into play. If I just say, I am sick, and I really let myself be sick, and I rest, I respect the fact that I'm sick, and I cut back all my other unnecessary activities, I eat things that are good for me, I slow things down and attend to what my body actually needs because it's been affected by disease, then I'll probably recover faster. But if I deny that and push myself and keep going to work and take a bunch of drugs to mask over the, the symptoms, it, that's just going to fester. And I'm probably going to experience being sick for longer and just linger in that state longer than I would need to. Eventually, maybe it would go away, but the, the scarring of that, that, you know, that would probably be something even more 
that I have to work with later. And it's the same with kind of, you know, political situations in the world today too. You know, we're pushing back so much or people are pushing back against so much of what they think is wrong and that it, it shuts down dialogue, right? It's, it's closing off communication and exchanges of ideas and it's basically like one is trying to triumph over the other and it's just mm-hmm. not working, as mm-hmm. you can see. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, can't we recognize that conservative and liberal, these are, they're all in us, right? These elements are in us. And like, these things coexist. It's not like, you know, that's why, you know, that's why life is great. And we're making progress because we have both sides. And we need both sides to have a conversation. It's not like, no, because you're liberal or you're conservative, I can't talk to you. Anyways. Yes. (laughs) That's so beautiful. And you said you you had a, a mentor. But this mentor was not a person. This mentor was a tree. And <laughs> yeah. can you tell me what that tree told you? Oh, the tree in the book? The tree in the book. Or uh, I guess, okay. yeah, that's I've true. spoken there to so be many, many trees. trees. I have a lot of mentors. <laughs> so uh, the tree in the book. Right. So I, um, I like to talk to trees. And some people may think that's perfectly normal. And others may think it's a little a little flowery, a little woo-woo. I have found, though, when I feel connected to a tree, and often I'll, I'll, I'll see a tree and I'll just be drawn to it, and often it's an older, wiser tree, and I always ask it permission first, and I go up to it and put my head up against the tree, and then I'll ask it if there's anything I should know. That's a real simple question. Is there anything I should know? So a few years back, I was hiking in Switzerland and near the top of this amazing kind of climb, there was this really old pine and it, was, it just, it looked like it had been there for centuries, probably had been. And I went up to it and I was like, oh, I've got to ask you. So I, I put my forehead against it and it, it overlooked these gorges and valleys and it was just a stunning position it was in. And uh, I said, is there anything I need to know? And without hesitation, the words came immediately to me, stay vast. And it was like, oh, good advice. (laughs) And the vast view is actually something that I've found helps so often when I get caught up in a sense of small, petty concerns, like I, me, my drama of my life and my problems and my concerns and uh, my issues. Um, meanwhile, you know, that, that tree is just standing there with its magnificent kind of presence and view. And it is a reminder to me. It's like so much more happening. Um, and when we can move from that, that small sense of self to a vaster view, it tends to very quickly assuage any kind of um, volcanic activity or doubt or uh, this kind of closing in and contraction around self and it just gives space and we are going to come back to that to spaciousness but can i bring up (laughs) can i bring up one more uh, metaphor before we move on to like some ways we could apply this to our mind and our bodies right and the world you bring up the field and you bring up soil and you talk about Mencius, uh, that ancient Chinese philosopher, and how <laughs> he's saying, you know, we can't just like, you want the plant to grow, you can't just grab it and try to uproot it, right? You can't, you can't force these things. And you mention how we need patience. Seeds take a while to sprout. It, it takes some time for them to rise above the surface. So, Mimi, are you telling me that self-cultivation, you know, we're not going to see the results right away? Because, because, because I mean, yeah. I mean, let's let's. I'm I'm being facetious, of course, but let me cut to the heart of this, which is in our culture, which is so strongly oriented towards hacking our way to quicker, better, more. Mm-hmm. Right, and here you're telling me, you know, this requires practice, and this requires enjoying the activity for what it is. This metaphor of the garden to me is so powerful, and it kind of, in my opinion, it's, it bleeds through every part of the book. Can you please explain how this is related to Su Yang? So Xiu Yang, yeah, Xiu Yang. Sorry, I keep mispronouncing it. I failed my Chinese <laughs> <Yeah>. courses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
the idea in Chinese medicine, which underpins a lot of the ideas in self-cultivation and uh, self-healing in Chinese beliefs and philosophy, is that we go to a doctor and we see the doctor not as a mechanic, but as a gardener. Right? And we see ourselves as a garden and not as a machine. And I think we created machines, human beings. You know, we like the predictability of them. We like the quick responses of them where the machines or computers are faster and faster and they may even overtake our capacity. They have overtaken our capacity to uh, process information. And so I think that we're trying to model ourselves in part after something we've created. Right? Yeah, and we've, we've also, from another inheritance, we've also come to believe that uh, we should treat our bodies and our health and our, our athleticism even like the, the ancient Greeks did, which they, you know, they idolized the Greek gods. You know, they participated in Olympics and decathlons in order to become faster, better, you know, more, be- more impossibly beautiful than they could be. They wanted to be like the gods, right? And so we've inherited that notion of perfectionism and sort of a superhuman quality. And it's just sort of a creating this pressure on ourselves, you know, to outperform, break our records, achieve faster, get a hack, kind of almost become godlike which is what machines are in a sense, right? They're, they're, they're all so, so powerful. You know, we don't have to drive ourselves. The, the car will drive us. Yeah. They never go to sleep. They never go to sleep. Right, right. If you feel you have to kind of rest, it's because your batteries are drained like a dying iPhone battery, right? You have to recharge yourself. You know, it's in our language. Now even it's like biomechanics, right? And it's just all this... Yeah. This sense of um, of of distancing ourselves from our our innate humaneness and our naturalness, and I think Emerson said it. You know, nature's pace is medium to slow, and you know the planet's been around billions of years, six billion years, and we're just a small fragment of that time. In a garden, if you've ever done any gardening, uh, I, I'm learning all this a lot because we've just moved out to the countryside two years ago. But if you want to have bulbs in the spring, you've got to plant them in the autumn. Okay. If you want big garlics and onions, you can't plant them in the winter. And nothing will happen because there's, there's not going to be any growth. If you plant them in the spring, you'll get small ones. If you plant them in the fall, you'll get really juicy big ones. Okay. Yeah. And, and so things take a little bit of planning. They also take an assessment. you got to look kind of to see... You know, in a garden, what's been neglected, what's been overlooked, what are the shady spots, what are the sunny spots, where is the protection from wind, what's the quality of the soil like, has it been kind of cracked and, and caked up, or is it soggy from too much too much water? And it's the same in our own bodies. And to, to shift something in nature takes a while. You can't just take a cracked, barren piece of land and expect it to start flowering and, and growing things um, right away. Sometimes land has to lie fallow, it has to be fertilized, you have to nitrogen fix it. Um, there's all these things that, you know, we know how to do if you're farming or you're in nature. You know, we know how to take care of a, a plant better than we know how to take care of ourselves. And we, we kind of lose the metaphors and analogies because I think we've adapted these other ones, which are like the machine or to be like the Greek gods that they worshipped. And so we've kind of stepped away from our uh, humanity or our our natural capacity of being human. And we've, we've also created this increasing separation between head and body. I talked a little bit about this in the, in the book, but I recently read something, and he described it so perfectly. It was this guy, Philip Shepard, and he said, we have given so much privilege to the head and and so much um, denigration to the body that we now do a head count to see how many people are in the room and a body count to see how many people are dead. Oh, that's, yeah, wow. (laughs) Right? It's powerful, yeah. Yeah. And we're so head-centered. And the head, if you've ever done movement practices... Right? And, and this is the, coming back to an earlier topic of embodiment. Have you ever done movement practices? The body is, is getting supervised constantly by the thinking head. 
And I see people going into a yoga pose and they're, they're rushing into it because they know what the shape is like and they're anxious to get into it. And meanwhile, the body's like, uh, hello, wait, wait, wait. You know, I, I haven't felt this. I haven't actually put myself into a state of receptivity yet. I'm just being supervised by the head. So I'm often getting people to, to flip that around. You know, can the body supervise the experience? You know, can the intelligence of the body have a, have a, have a say? And that slows us down. You know, we become so disembodied, but the body moves much slower than the, the rapid firing thinking mm, mind. Yeah. Um, and, and we, you know, to honor the body, we could just slow down a little more, feel more into our, our, our the, the experiences of uh, breath and movement and um, how that then you know, is responded to by kind of cognition and, and knowing, you know, and it's not to say that the mind is a bad thing. It's a, it's a brilliant thing. It's a luminous thing. You know, it's, it's, it's powerful. And there's a, an amazing intelligence to the body that we're missing sometimes. And it's just getting submerged beneath the, the noise and kind of dominance of, of thinking mind. Yeah. I mean, that is, uh, gosh, that that strikes the heart at, you know, what I'd really like to explore more on this show is, you know, this embodied cognition and why do yeah. these two things have to be separate, right? Mind and body, like, again, unity. And what can yeah. they learn from each other? And how how can they work together? I'd like to talk to you about how we can apply right this the self cultivation to to our bodies, mm. and the chapter I'm specifically thinking about is uh, when you talk about exercise and basically training for yourself when you're ten years older, yeah. not for your current age. And being a former uh, collegiate athlete myself, that really struck me because I'm sure this comes across in your yoga classes. You know, people are probably, I, I don't do much yoga, but I'm guessing people want to master like crazy poses and, and like show <laughs> off their feats of strength and, you know, how amazing they are. But how, how can you, you know, encourage that mindset with your students and are they receptive to it? I am encouraged. I think people are receptive to it. I think the confluence of, uh, what's happening with the environment and uh, the emergencies of kind of climate change are feeding people's awareness of, you know, slowing things down and uh, being a little gentler and kinder to themselves. There's a sense, I think, that uh, people can benefit quite a lot from turning their awareness more inwards. And, and you know, I, I hope in my classes I kind of point people in that, in that direction when I say something like that to someone trained for 10 years older than you are, it always takes them off, off guard. Like it throws them off guard and it takes them by surprise. And when they think about it, they, they say that makes so much sense. I think a lot of people have simply never given it much thought because everything that we're told is you exercise to look younger. Yeah. You're, tr we're training for to be 10 years <laughs> younger, right? Not 10 years older. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. And I think speaking to people who are getting older, they kind of respond to that even more than say someone who's 20 years old, you know, someone's 20 years old, the whole world is open to them and not really thinking that, you know, 40 is ancient, but I think someone who's 40, you know, someone who's 50, you say, you know, think about when you're 50 or 60, there may be some resistance to it, but then, you know, if you couch it in language that is, simply saying, be respectful of your body, like take care of this, this form of yours that, that you're given. It's, a, it's an act of self-compassion to actually honor the aging process and honor uh, the inevitable, which is decaying and dying. And, you know, that, that also is a topic that's so taboo in so much of the West is death. And, um, and and this idea of, of getting older, 
uh, that comes with death. <laughs> it's just the only thing we, we know for certain. But I'm really encouraged. I think people, when they're given the opportunity to, to be kind towards themselves, it may initially feel a little hard, uh, but... It, isn't that ironic? Isn't that ironic that being, being kind to ourselves feels hard? Like the way you put mm-hmm. that just, just is so perfect. Oh, mm-hmm. man. So, you know, on that note of death, uh, another chapter you talk about the seasons of our lives and the times of day and like these cycles that I guess you could say that the ancient Chinese believed in. Could you talk more about those cycles of age and season and time of day and maybe some some tips you could give us there on on how we could, you know, apply those to to self-cultivate ourselves? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> skipping many paragraphs here, but <laughs> there's a there's a sense that we're the the microcosm of the macrocosm, and so within our bodies, you know, each of our organ and meridian networks relates to a um, an element or phase, which is wood, fire, earth, metal, or water. These in turn relate to seasons. And the seasons move in a way that correspond to the, the cyclical turns of yin and yang. So everything is related from you know, the larger macrocosm to the sort of smaller microcosm. And part of self-cultivation is aligning ourselves and harmonizing with the, the natural movements of these phases and these seasons, which have you know, organ related, uh, related organs. And then the organs have related times of day. So, you know, they've done some tests on the, uh, the activity of, say, your stomach in the morning, and it, it just has more neurological activity and, and general function between 7 and 9 in the morning. So it's a great time to eat breakfast because you'll digest everything <laughs> really well. Whereas if you eat a big meal at night and your stomach's not as active, it's going to sit in you. For example, they say not to eat too much at night, especially sugary things and uh, highly caloric things, because basically between one and three in the morning is your liver's hours. And that they've also done studies like that's so when the liver's most active. Just from a physiological perspective, the liver at that time of night when you're asleep, hopefully, uh, the liver's producing a ton of insulin because your body needs that. If you're not eating while you're sleeping, it still needs to produce insulin to keep your body going. But if you've already eaten a big meal at night and then your liver starts producing insulin, a lot of people say, oh, I'm always like waking up between like, you know, two in the morning. It's like, well, that's because there's a surge of excess energy flowing through your body and it'll stimulate you and make you up. So, you know, in terms of a day, those are simple things that you can think about, like eat a really good breakfast. Don't don't eat a lot at night. And then in, in the life, yeah, in a life cycle, the, the, the phases of wood and fire and earth and metal and water, they also correspond to uh, sort of the years of 1 to 20 for wood. So if you look in nature, there's a surge of springtime energy in, in you know, sort of February, March, April, where flowers that have, you know, flowers start blooming and it greens really quickly and there's an upward momentum. That's sort of like our youthful years. We kind of sprout up, we grow, and then at 20, we kind of start reaching maturity. And between 20 and 40, fire time is like a time of um, kind of connection. And hopefully, like, you'll start to meet sort of your community and establish yourself in a way that feels like there's a purpose. You know, there's there's this maturing time. And, and that's summer, you know. And... Um, that's when like the green is sort of like a, a nice green and it's warm days, like things are, are pretty good. There, there's a joyful time, right? And then it goes into earth season. So from like 40 to kind of 50-ish levels off. You know, hopefully, if you've had a good growing period as a young person and a relatively stable uh, fire period, then you'll, you'll enjoy this kind of ah, late summer kind of not too cold, not too hot, very even. And then you go into autumn, and that's when you start slowing down, you know, 60, 60 to 80, let's say, or 60 to 70. And that's when we start to slow down, we let go. It's the same thing that happens in nature with uh, metal, which is the, the autumn season. You know, leaves fall off of the trees. That's kind of the archetypal image of autumn. 
uh, that letting go, the days get shorter, the temperature drops. But there's also this kind of preciousness to things. Like we can really see like the beauty of nature when things fall away. And then there's a Christmas to the air. So there's a, a sense that in the autumn, there's a time of appreciation. And in those years, we can really slow down and appreciate the the life that we've led and the achievements that we've done and uh, start to have more clarity and, and um, kind of a, a courage around owning all of that. Um, and then it goes to the later years, you know, 70, 80 to ideally 100. <laughs> if you're going to live to 100, that would be winter and water, which is that time of rest, you know, slowing down and, and, and of, um, of wisdom. Yes. Oh, that's so beautiful. Mm. And uh, we, we often, you know, in the West, again, like we kind of fear the wisdom, or we, we fear, don't fear the wisdom, but we fear the age, and we overlook the wisdom that can come with the age. And do you, like, apply those seasons to your, your work, for example? In spring, you know, you're writing a book or starting a new book or starting new classes or whatever that is. I'm just curious, you know, because I know you're a practitioner of all this, too. I do try to live more seasonally. It is feels really good when I do. Like if someone, you know, I saw recently was asking how I've been. It's like, you know what? I've been really chill. Like <laughs> January, February, it's been really spacious. And it all hasn't always been that way, but I've really kind of made a conscious effort of not packing my early part of the year when it's winter. You know, December, I stopped teaching mid-December, went to see my family, I really took a break. And then it's been, I've done some teaching and I've done some work in the last couple of months, but it hasn't been a lot. I've um, been cooking a lot and kind of, um, going lots of walks, doing some planning for the gardening and you know, some initial planning for the year. And now I'm starting to feel like, oh, you know, spring is, is, is pretty much here. And I do have new projects. I'm starting to do a little bit more work. It feels more aligned for me. Um, I, also, I also teach seasonally. So in my classes in, in Qigong and in, in uh, yoga, I'll have different themes and narratives woven in. There's been uh, in the UK the last month or so there's been hurricane kira followed by storm dennis followed by another storm there's been really strong winds so i've been teaching a lot about the importance of rooting and studying and grounding and uh kind of being able to withstand the winds of change <laughs> um, but also seeing wind as something not to resist but to see it as something that that builds resilience and strength we jump to uh, spaciousness because you just mentioned it could you please share with our, our listeners like this this idea of wuji wuji uh, yeah <laughs> and you know like kind of guide us through that I, I love that chapter on spaciousness and not seeing you know for example what in the cup but the the space within the cup and the growing space within the cup you know as we drink and the space around objects and being in spaces that allow us to grow and choosing people that respect us in the space that we're in or, or give us that space to be our whole balanced selves. So emptiness is often the term used for wuji. And in the West, again, or in English, emptiness often has a negative connotation. It, it sort of suggests a deficiency or a lack. Empty fuel tank, empty bank account. <laughs> And emptiness, though, in, in Taoist philosophy and in Qigong and, and in Buddhism as well, is actually the this, this space of potential. And it's a space of, uh, like you were saying, a cup, right? That it's, not, it's, the, it's the cup that holds the tea. Right? And without, if, if the, 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 the cup were full, then no tea could go in. And so we need that emptiness of the, the cup to, to fill. Similarly with a room, you know, if you walk into a room and it's crammed full of furniture and things and there's no space, then it's not as enjoyable. You know, it's like you have to have a space in the room to actually go in and 
can't use it and feel like there's uh, a purpose for it. So if you if we think about that kind of spaciousness, it changes our ideas about you know what's possible. It also separates us out a little bit from uh, or distances us rather from this idea that uh, we need to assert our authority or a sense that we're right or we're wrong, like a an opinion an opinion on things. Because in the moment we try to do that, it kind of closes the parameters down and we get much less room to explore and to feel. But I remember in one of the Taoist precepts back in the Han Dynasty, one of their, their vows that a Taoist had to take was to, to never try to prove yourself right. <laughs> I love that. Isn't it wonderful? It's like, wow. That is the antithesis of most radio talk shows. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and, and this, this sense of spaciousness that comes with um, kind of a, you know, a heart that has a little more room to meet things. It follows on from a naturalism, but this, this also sense that to create the right space for us or to create a healthy growing space for us, like you were saying, to, to surround yourself with people who really support and understand and encourage um, the development you know, that, that you're aligned with, um, it's important. You know, the Buddha talked about this, with the importance of sangha and spiritual community that is in, in, in line with, um, with uh, what you're, you're looking to do. So, yeah, it's, um, it's a beautiful concept, I think, that people, it's a simple one as well, but it's a virtue that you can, that you can cultivate simply by starting to pay attention to when your, your heart doesn't feel spacious. If you start to feel like you're uh, closing in and contracting around something, really challenge that, like get a little in inquisitive and curious. I remember this is, this is one example that wasn't in the book, but I remember once one of my uh, main yoga teachers, uh, she had a horse riding accident and she was supposed to teach some retreats in Iceland I was on my like 10 year honeymoon and she was like calling me and emailing, messaging me. And she basically wanted to know if I could step in and teach the retreats for her if she, if she needed them, if she, you know, if she couldn't do it or she couldn't find anyone, like would I do it? And at first I was like, Oh no, you know, like, first of all, like, am I prepared to do that? And then I had all these things planned for that time and everything would have to change, but she's my teacher. Right. And so I, I, I was like, let me think about it for a day. And when I started to think, oh, I can't do this, it was this closing in and a contraction. And I actually asked, I said, you know, what would my father advise me to do? He was like a very ethical but uh, well-rounded thinker about things. And he would say, you know, be generous. And, that, and that's a quality of spaciousness, like be generous. And as soon as I said, you know what, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do that for her. Like I felt this openness to my heart and this real gratitude for like being able to help someone who was really seeking out some assistance and some emergency interventions. And in the end, she found some, like we came up with someone else for her to have teach it, but it felt so good for me to kind of feel that spaciousness. Um, yeah. And then, and then I think, it leads to this sense of uh, what I, you know, when the heart feels less constricted, it leads to this quality of equanimity. And um, it doesn't mean that you don't care to be equanimous. It actually means you care a lot. <laughs> and, and that you care so much that you're able to meet all experience from a heart that's very free and very loving. And that isn't reactive, but calm and able to kind of meet whatever is unfolding from that calmer, kinder place um, of, of decision-making. So one chapter that I absolutely loved and I want to talk to you more about is Freeing the Inner Critic from mm. Self-Concern to Self-Cultivation because our audience is people who are self-employed creators and often we've just struck out on our own 
you mentioned this phrase, humble inquiry, in this chapter that really stuck with me in that the criticism that we hear in our mind for striking out on our own path or doing something that's not conventional and learning how to differentiate what is a constructive, I guess you could call criticism, versus just this empty chatter that's holding us back and breaking us and and keeping us small, you know, like learning to inquire between those two and, and be aware of that. Could you help us with this? So the simplest way for me to differentiate is there's um, constructive criticism or helpful criticism is criticism that doesn't become cruel and judgmental and punishing. You know, there's a voice in us that is helpful to say, you could do better. Like, what could you work to improve? What can you put in as good effort? And okay, so you made a mistake there, but let's just look at the situation, assess it, make a better decision, move, move on. Right. The inner critic's voice would say, you always mess up. You're never prepared enough. You make these mistakes again and again. You're never going to change. You don't have this in you. You should have never started this project. You should get a different job. Mm. <laughs> but it undermines the goodness of our work. It's cruel. It's, it's, uh, it's really harsh and prickly. Yeah, and it, it sabotages our good efforts. Yeah, that's the critic's voice. Yes. And you talk about invoking a protector. Yes. <laughs> I love this so much. Can you tell us about this? Yeah. So in Buddha in in, in the Buddha's sort of uh uh, telling of it or the stories of the Buddha's awakening, there's this demon, Mara, who is constantly um, going after the Buddha and tempting him with greed, hatred, delusion, desire, and doubt. Right? And the Buddha constantly kind of deflects the, the, the desire and deflects the aversion and anger and, and all of these things. But doubt is the one that he's really unable to deflect effectively. And even on the night of his awakening, he's like, um, about to get awakened and Mara comes back and basically says, Buddha, you don't really have this in you, do you? Right? He plants the seed of doubt. And so the Buddha, recognizing that this is a really insidious form of, of sabotage, he needs more than just his own resources. And he, he bends down, he touches the earth with the hand, it's, it's uh, called like Bumi Mudra or something like that. And he says, he calls on the earth goddess as his witness, and he says, I belong here. Okay. And then Mara goes, oh, oh, and slinks away. And so we sometimes need a protector. We need something stronger than ourselves to overcome the, the viciousness and sort of the, the daggers of doubt. Yes. And in Tibetan, Tibetan iconography, you have Mahakala, who is this fanged, fierce, uh, sword wielding, and, and, and you know, stands in a circle of flames demigod, who's really, you know, kind of badass looking. And he's holding a sword basically to sh cut through the head of judgment, slash it off. Wow. Um, and so the, Tibet the Tibetans look at Mahakala as their protector. Like they invoke someone so fierce like that to banish Mara and excuse my language, but basically it's like, fuck off Mara. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Yeah. And, and because doubt and the inner critic is so strong, you'll never win an argument against it. It'll always say, but, you know, and yes. it always get under you. And so you just have to say, you have to be really strong and you have to either get this protector like Mahakala or one example I heard that I love is Gandalf the Great. <laughs> like, stop. You know, and Belzog is there and Balzog, the, the demon, and he uses his staff and he basically says, like, you know, puts it in the ground, breaks the bridge, says, thou shall not pass. Right. Um, and for me, my, my protector is my dad. Yeah, that's what reminded me of this is when you mentioned him, you know, in your mm -hmm. story. Like, what would my dad do? But yeah, amazing. Yeah. Yeah, my dad, I, um, I was very fortunate, and I know not, not everyone has um, a parent, especially um, as a protector, but I, was, you know, I just had this beautiful relationship with my father where 
I knew sort of especially toward the end of his life, like I, I understood that all he really wanted was for me to be happy. And there was this, this love that we had. And he is the one who I call to stand in between myself and Mara or the critic in doubt. And when he's in front of me, in between myself and Mara, then I, I multiply him and he's, he circles Whoa, me and I'm yeah. protecting all sides. And I stand in the center of that circle and I just feel safe. Like, And I feel like actually I can look at Mara from um, the circle, outside of the circle of my father. And I look at Mara and I can feel very kind of compassionate for Mara. Like this, to feel mm-hmm. doubt and that that kind of ugliness of... Of, of being critical and, and undermining and, and um, harsh it doesn't feel good. Yeah. And actually, it, it's a really, you know, sad feeling to have, you know, if, especially if we turn it towards ourselves. So, um, yeah, my protector is my dad. I remember one time I was on a workshop and one woman said her protector is Tina Turner. <laughs> What's love got to do? Got yeah, to yeah. do. <laughs> Sorry, that's my bad attempt at singing, but that is hilarious. That would <laughs> that is powerful. Oh my god, Tina Turner with that hair and like her hands yeah. stuck up. Ooh. Yeah. Exactly. What an image of like infinite versions of your father surrounding you in a circle and protecting you. What really strikes me about that story is you share this story in the book about how for many years you strove for your dad's approval, right? Mm -hmm. And that you were a photojournalist and they Mm -hmm. they loved that, I guess, or they they approved of that. But you you felt that they they wouldn't introduce you as Mimi the yoga teacher, right? And you felt the pain of that until one day, you know, your dad said, yeah, like, I'm happy that that, that you're happy. Um, Mm. Because I know you've been through the valleys of that with uh, your previous work and maybe even still now. What encouragement could you give you know people that are working on their own and trying to do their best work but yeah you know that inner critic the voice is loud they're usually doing something that's not quite conventional or known yeah Um, and they're dealing with a lot of gray right they're dealing with a lot of gray about what they value what's important to them what society values what their dad or mom or family's value yeah i just uh Love to end our conversation on that. Hmm. I think a word that you said, or something that I'd written, humble inquiry, is really good to challenge the the validity. Are they actually true? Is what they're doing actually something that others are disapproving of? And if so, is that is that a valid disapproval, or is it just something that they hold to be true and is not actually true for yourself? And so, so much of our critic comes from our familial and societal uh, Im- imposed views from our families and society. So it's a really healthy inquiry to challenge whether those are actually true. You know, what do we believe? What do you believe? And, and you probably will believe something quite different, which is why you're an entrepreneur and you know, why you're self-employed, like why you're sort of stepping out in a direction that is going against the stream of conventional ideas and work. And to, to, to also to, to recognize, one of my teachers, Martin, says this a lot, to recognize the goodness of your practice, hmm. you know, to recognize the goodness of what you're doing and to really affirm that the work that you're doing is, is contributing something positive. Hmm. And to, to keep sight on that. And then thirdly, fuck off, Mara. <laughs> Touch the ground. Touch the ground. I, I, yeah. I say this to my students a lot. You know, and new teachers who are stepping into a class for the first time and nervous, I say, just touch the ground and, and say to yourself, like you really mean it, I belong here. Yes. Because the inner critic is basically telling us that we don't have a right to be here and we don't belong here and that, that you know, we're doing something wrong, which is, is being questioned by family or society or whomever or ourselves. Right. And and that that we have every right to be here. This is our earth. You know, this is our home, the earth. So, yeah, those strategies are really I I found them really helpful. You know, when 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 they actually work and usually they do. It feels like there's um, a sincerity that can flower and bloom again. You know, 
this is this is the right place. This is where I'm supposed to be and what I'm supposed to be doing, and and it's it's legitimate. Mm. Wow, that's 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 so great, and I love that. Like I belong here, right? I belong here. Touch the earth. I belong here. To bring it all back to the beginning, you know, this unity that even though you you do belong here, you're just this small part of this whoo, big world we live in. And like as you put it, inner balance to outward peace and radiance um, mm. is is a phrase you use. And so, could you just close this conversation with you know any 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 last thoughts you you have on that? I think taking care of yourself is also taking care of this world. Uh, and I think right now we are recognizing we, we have to take active involvement in what's happening globally, uh, environmentally, but people don't recognize that that work can start just from within. And everything that you uh, do to contribute to your own self-healing process of self-cultivation um, is going to have an impact in in the world because it's not separate. It's n- it's not selfish either, is it? And it's not selfish nor narcissistic. If it's genuinely something that is founded on the grounds of self compassion and, and care, it breeds that and it it moves it ripples that out into the world. Yeah. It does create that 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 sense of inner uh, steadiness or balance. And, and balance isn't being perfect. Balance is just being able to get back up on your feet when you fall down, right? Um, you don't stay sick for three weeks. You stay sick for three days. Like you've got resilience. Balance, when we've got that, it does move out into the world. And it's so important to recognize that, you know, very small steps that you take to take care of yourself is also having an impact directly on what's all around us, you know, on the planet. Yeah. Well, I think that's a perfect place to end. Mimi, thank you so much for spreading your light out into the world and um, affecting so many people and myself. Just for me, because I truly believe like we need to de- develop our own philosophies for what really matters to us. And so just seeing you do that yeah. through this book, which is a combination of so many things I'm curious about, but it's it's your journey and it's these ancient Eastern philosophies and your physical practice, which, you know, is so important to me as well. It's been really instructive, and I hope one day I can write a book that is um, just as powerful and dynamic. So thank you again for coming on the show. I I sincerely appreciate it. Oh, thanks so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review on whatever podcast app or platform you use. It helps more people find the show and I would sincerely appreciate it. Thanks again. And remember, you can find all the show notes and links mentioned in this episode at upstartist.tv slash ace. That's A-S-E. Hope to see you over there to continue the conversation.